Shikoro che sabata njimbo ya kanaka Moyo uri kutone ram kupindam sabata Sabata ranaka Sabata ranaka Moyo uri Soneram kupindam sabatam Pano moyo wakatanga Sa jesu kuziwa Nekuchaka nzira yake Na wana sabatam Sabatam Sabata ranaka Moyo uri kutone roku pindam sabata Pano jesu wakamira wakandida izam Kutindino musaruza muiri sabata Sabata ranaka Sabata ranaka Moyo uri kutone rom kupindam sabata I'd like to greet you all in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Really excited to be with you and to be able to study from the word of God. Again this Sabbath we are studying from the book of Isaiah. This is the very last lesson in our quarter. The lesson is the rebirth of planet Earth. Before we go too far in our study, let's just pause for a word of prayer. Father in heaven, we have opened up your word. We pray that you may speak to us and help us to hear your voice. This I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our memory text is coming from the book of Isaiah, Isaiah 65, verse 17. It says, For behold, I create a new heaven and a new earth. The former things shall not be remembered or come to mind. There's a young boy named Billy who read a book on astronomy. After he read this book, he refused to go to school. The mother didn't know what to do with him and decided to take him to the family doctor. When they got to the doctor, the doctor asked him, Billy, what's the problem? Why don't you want to go to school? And Billy mentioned, I read a book on astronomy. And I discovered that the world is going to burn up anyway because of the heat of the sun. One day, everything will be burned. So there is no point really going to school or trying to be productive because we are all going to die. His mother got upset and started shouting, that's not your business. Why do you care when the world is going to burn? Yours is to go to school. Um, the doctor uh, looked at him and said, well, Billy, don't worry. By the time that all happens, all of us will be dead Anyway, that's still a long way off. Well, Billy uh, may have had a point uh, looking at the meaning of life. If we are all going to burn up and there is no future, it gives us no reason for existence. Thankfully, the Bible predicts a very different ending. The Bible promises that God is going to come and make all things new. Isaiah sees a new heaven and a new earth and describes it in very powerful and pointed language. Isaiah 65 from verse 17 to 25 gives a detailed outline of what Isaiah sees in the new heaven and new earth. We're not going to read all the verses but we want to pick a few for us to be able to understand the heart of the matter. Isaiah 65 verse 17 says, So I will create a new heaven and a new earth, for the former things will not be remembered, nor will they come to mind. Verse 20, Never again will there be an infant 
who lives but a few days, or an old man who does not live out his years. The one who dies at a hundred will be thought to be a mere child. The one who fails to reach a hundred will be considered accursed. Um, then I'd also like to read verse 22, the first part. No longer will they build houses and others live in them. Nor will they plant and others eat. For as the days of a tree, so will be the days of my people. My chosen ones will long enjoy the work of their hands. Beautiful promise. Finally, verse 25. It says, the wolf and the lamb will feed together. A lion will eat straw like an ox. The dust will be the serpent's food. And they will neither harm nor destroy on my holy mountain says the Lord. What a beautiful picture that is painted. There'll be no more carnivores. All the animals will be gone vegetarian. There'll be peace and tranquility in this new earth. No need to fear snakes anymore. Lions will be, uh, will, will be like pets and they'll eat grass. This is the new heaven and new earth that Isaiah is predicting. He speaks about a final restoration for God's people. This gives us hope, hope beyond the order of things that we see in the world today. Instead of living, imagine, instead of living for 60, 90, or even 100 years, if people lived for millions of years, would that solve the fundamental human problems? If people lived millions of years, well, first of all, you'd still have the threat of death. Secondly, there's all the pain, sin, and corruption that we still see. So the ultimate solution is for God to bring about a new creation, a new heaven, and a new earth. The deepest need of humanity is renewal. And this renewal is renewal that we find within the word of God. A divine magnet. Going on into Isaiah chapter 66, and I'd like to read verse 3, Isaiah 66, verse 3, Isaiah 66, verse 3, but whoever sacrifices a bull is like a person who offers a lamb, is like one who breaks a dog's neck, whoever makes a grain offering, like one who presents pig's blood. Whoever burns a memorial incense, like one who worships an idol, they have chosen their own ways. They delight in their abominations. All right, some strong words being said here by Isaiah, um, likening people who are worshiping God, who are doing what they think is good and what they think is right. And Isaiah says, this is the same as pagan practice. What Isaiah is talking about here is a form of godliness without the true power. You know, when people decide to do things as ritual, when you decide to do things just um, out of formality, not really worshiping God from the heart. And he says doing this is just the same as heathenism or paganism. So Isaiah calls the people of God to change their practice and the way that they worship. God serves as some kind of divine magnet that draws people to himself. And this we find as we read Isaiah 66, verse 18 and verse 19. Isaiah 66, verse 18 and 19. Here is what it says. And I, because of what they have planned and done, am about to come and gather all the nations and languages, and they will come and see my glory. And he goes on to mention the different nations from where these people are going to be coming from, from Tarshish to the Libyans to Tubal and the Greeks. All of them are going to be coming to the nation of the Lord. God attracts all the nations of the earth to himself. And he acts as this divine magnet attracting pulling people to himself. That is the design and mission of God, that people be drawn to him. God desires that we come close 
to him, that we are drawn to him in reverence. Why do I underline the, le- the word reverence? Because in Isaiah 65, 66 verse 5, it also speaks about coming before the word of God with trembling. The word trembling here is speaking about the need to reverence, honor, and respect God for who he is, our creator, maker, redeemer, and king. Missionaries and worship leaders. God has designed that his people serve these two roles as missionaries and as worship leaders. That is what his people are supposed to do. Um, Isaiah um, 66, 19 and 20 speaks about survivors from the exile being missionaries and bringing other people to worship God. So they serve a dual role. First, they help bring people to God, and then they lead out in the worship of God. These two roles are roles that God has called us as his children to also do. God expects us to bring people to him, to help attract people to Christ, and also help lead out in worshiping Christ. We need to demonstrate how God should be worshipped. What is the significance of God's promise to take some of them and priests and as Levites? Let's read that in Isaiah 66, verse 21. Isaiah 66, verse 21. It says, I will select some of them also to be priests and Levites. Some of the people who had gone into exile. God says, now I'm choosing you to serve as Levites. These are people who are not necessarily born into the right family, not people who are not born as Levites, and some people who are not born into the priestly family, but God calls them and includes them in his mission. This shows us that the mission of God is inclusive and not exclusive. God brings in everyone, and he wants all to participate in this work. This is what Peter goes on to make clear as we read 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9 and 10. Peter says, you are a royal priesthood, a holy nation. That means the entire Christian church, all those who believe in God have been called to join in and be a part of the priesthood. That's why very often in the Christian church, we'll speak about the priesthood of all believers. All of us have been called to be priests and kings in the house of the Lord. God expects all hands on deck when it comes to fulfilling the gospel commission. The community of faith. Community of faith. God describes the entire nation of Israel as a nation of priests. But we keep reading throughout the New Testament, and God gives that famous great commission in Matthew chapter 28, verse 19, where he declares, Go ye therefore and make disciples of all nations. It's important to underline that word, all nations. First, God sought to attract all nations to himself, as we have already read in our lesson, that God is trying to bring people to himself. Then he commissions his disciples to preach the gospel to all nations. Paul also describes um, what happens when the gospel is preached. He says there is now neither Jew nor Gentile, male nor female. Paul is declaring that God has broken down the walls that were separating different peoples. And Paul declares the beauty of people coming to God, that the entire Christian church becomes priests. Now, think about that for a little moment. First, the priesthood was limited to those who were born among the Levites and those who were born in particular in Aaron's family. Then the priesthood becomes extended to the entire nation of Israel. Now the priesthood has been extended to all who believe. So the Bible describes us as a nation 
of priests, as a royal priesthood. All in the church are to preach and send out the gospel of love in light of the cross and in light of the gospel commission. Why is any kind of spiritual, ethnic, or even political elitism so abhorrent in the sight of God? Look closely at yourself. Are you harboring any sense of spiritual or ethnic superiority? If so, you really need to repent because the gospel doesn't separate. The gospel brings people together. The gospel gives all of us value. We are all the purchase of his blood. None can be higher than the other, but all are equal, not only in the eyes of God, but we also need to learn to treat each other with equality. So shall your seed and your name remain. Beautiful promise is given in Isaiah 66, verse 22. It says, as the new heavens and the new earth that I will make will endure before me, declares the Lord, so will your name and descendants endure. Let me also read verse 23. It says, from one new moon to another, from one Sabbath to another, all mankind will come and bow before me, says the Lord. God gives this promise that the name of his people is going to endure for a really long time. It's going to endure forever. And God is really saying in that new earth, the earth made new, there will be no more death. And this is a message that John makes clear in the book of Revelation. In fact, as you're reading through this chapter, or these last two chapters of Isaiah, it almost seems like you're reading through Revelation 21 and 22. Very similar language, I think. John um, is echoing some of the promises that are in this book. And the promise that we have is that we are going to have a long life. Beyond that, the Bible also speaks about worshiping God from one Sabbath to the next, from one month to the next. Now, people can debate about exactly what this is speaking about, but for me it seems quite clear. It's saying from one week to the next, one Sabbath to the next. Our weeks marked by Sabbaths, we are going to be praising the Lord from one month to the next month. We are going to be praising the Lord. We'll be having time to gather together, worship and celebrate the goodness of the Lord. You have this beautiful example of what God is going to do for us. Lastly, I'd like us to read Isaiah 66 and verse 24. Isaiah 66, verse 24, it says, They will go out and look at the dead bodies of those who rebelled against me. The worms that eat them will not die, and the fire that burns them will not be quenched. They will be loathsome to all mankind. Here is a warning. Why does Isaiah end with the negative picture instead of ending with the positive? I mean, Isaiah could have ended just by speaking about the new heaven and the new earth. But Isaiah wants to give us a strong warning, a warning that destruction awaits those who rebel against God. There is a warning that there will be death outside for those who do not trust in God. And the Bible also speaks about this in the book of Revelation. When Isaiah is speaking about a fire that will not be quenched, it doesn't mean that the fire will not die down, but it means that the fire is going to be thorough in its destruction. It means that if we are not faithful to God, if we pull ourselves away from God, the end of us is going to be death. So as we wrap up this quarter, the injunction is, let us be faithful to God. Let us remain true to his dear name. Let us know that there is a better promise, a promise of a new heaven and a new earth, a promise where all God's people are going to live with him forever. God.